Okay, thank you for joining us for this uh, PowerPoint. This is a series of letters that was started some 10 years ago. My grandson Tyler was born in 2005. Three months later, his very proud grandmother Sandra, my wife of 44 years, died without their having developed a relationship. I felt Tyler deserved to have a record of his grandmother who left numerous footprints in her life's journey. The letters also include a brief history of the Sweden family, there is only one, some people say thank God, in America, and associated historical events summarized in this PowerPoint show. Having the biggest attic in the family, I seem to have accumulated six to seven generations of letters and artifacts from both sides of the family. In researching for this book, I found over 600 artifacts and letters dating back to the 1820s. I will not bore you with the 200 plus family members I put into Ancestry.com. We will discuss a few who are directly responsible for the pedigree being discussed in Letters to Tyler book. The first Speedon arrived in America, he was a stonemason from Melbourne, Scotland, settled in Virginia, was Robert Speedon, whose first son was born Christmas Day, 1797, and was my namesake, William Speedon. Clement Speedon, uh, C. Lee Speed, my father, uh, became vice president in the Speed and Company after uh, which this man started, uh, actually bought into the company in uh, 1903. Then my father became vice president in the Speed and Company after returning from uh, France in 1918. And my mother, Louise Speedin, my mother ran the farm while my, mother, my father was in the Army during World War II. She was also superintendent of surgical dressing volunteer ladies, <clears throat> uh, making surgical dressings for the Red Cross and military. After my father died, she ran the dairy until I got out of college, making her one of three female <clears throat> operators, dairy operators in the neighborhood, the others being the Sierra sisters of Meander Farm in Madison, Miss Kelly Clark of Cleveland Dairy, where the Orange Town sewer and sewage is processed today. And Lee Speed and my son and myself. But the two most important persons on this uh, show are Sandra Speed in here and Tyler himself here pictured at 13 years old. Robert Speed and died in the War of 1812, actually died in, in 1814 in a Spotsylvania hospital after <coughs> souring four children. He was a demolition expert, blowing up ammunition dumps, bridges, etc. His son, William, grew up exposed to the Navy in D.C., becoming purser of the Wilkes Expedition in 1838 under President Van Buren. This naval fleet of six ships circumvented the world in the United States' first effort to show its muscle to the world. The fleet was credited with sailing the closest to the Antarctica than any other previous naval exploration. Wilkes must have thought highly of Commodore Speedon because he named two islands in the Pacific after him, one in the Marshall Group, and there's a Speedon Island off of San Juan Island in the now state of Washington. The artifacts worked back from this expedition in 1841 were the nucleus of the Smithsonian Museum after the Englishman Smithson donated money for the museum in the United States. William Henry Harrison was president in 1841 when the fleet returned. But being a Whig, Harrison had little interest in the expedition in that Van Buren was a Democrat under whose command the fleet set sail four years earlier. This is a lithograph that I have of the hierarchy of the Perry fleet in Japan being entertained at a sumo wrestling match in 1854. The American party would have been the fleet captains of Perry and the purser. Perry was able to open Japan for trade and stop the Japanese from executing shipwreck sailors off of Japan and got a consulate open. His negotiating power was strengthened by the threat of nine American ships shelling the Japanese capital of Tokyo from Tokyo Bay. Then there were two brothers in the Civil War, the Leith brothers who rode with Mosby in the valley. My father, C. Lee Sweden, uh, was in the cavalry under General Pershing in 1916 one of three wars he was involved in, in a failed attempt to capture the Mexican revolutionary who attacked uh, Columbus, New Mexico, Pancho Villa. Next, Second World and First World War. This is a trench knife, uh, 
Army issue in World War I and it has a triangle blade and short blade for hand-to-hand uh, -hand trench uh, combat in the First World War. The World War I started in 1914, but the United States did not enter this war until April uh, 1917 due to President Wilson's isolationist and neutrality tendencies. Germans were first to use gas, mostly mustard and chlorine varieties. These United, the United States government used my father's company, the Ennisfeden Company, to manufacture some of the chlorine gas we used in retaliation. Captain Seedley Speeden, my father, uh, was in the Quartermaster Corps, again under Pershing, in the 3rd Division in France and then Germany. There are thousands of horses and mules to feed, bedding, uh, shoes, and nails had to be provided. One of his handwritten field notes refers to his shopping list as so many tons of hay and straw needed for the equines, but as a PS was scribbled, quote, and add 20 tons of additional straw, the men are running out of bedding in the trenches and need something to sleep on, end quote. After graduating from college, my mother <coughs> uh, wanted to help and join the American Committee for Devastated France to reorganize what was left of their communities. Looking after orphans was one of their projects. In the 1920s, uh, mainly because of the disastrous Versailles Treaty, inflation became so rampant in Germany that you'd get more BTUs out of your money by burning it than you could from the fuel it could buy. Back home in Virginia, let's, let's focus on some of the history of Hampstead Farm in Orange County. In 1877, 5,000 acres, 5,000 acres of land of my Hampstead Farm, which extended westward from the Rapidan River near Liberty Mills, almost to Barbersville, was another Barber family holding. Note, Hampstead and Somerset Farms used to be referred to as farms. Recent buyers has upped them to the plantations. At the time of sale, the land was owned by B. Johnson Barber. The 300-acre tract my father bought in 1936, in addition to the detached 200 acres of forest land, had been farmed by George Watson Barber, who died in 1935. The dairy was soon condemned after my father bought the property, so Dad had to build a new dairy in 1937. He hired John Carvin to build the dairy and was so impressed with his building skills he was hired again in 1939 to build my father's retirement home. The going carpenter wage at the time was one dollar a day. Dad witnessed the results of the depression and the labor's living standards and brought the neighbor's wrath down on himself by raising the daily wage to two dollars a day. The old dairy was remodeled in 1948 uh, to accommodate uh, our remaining four draft animals and uh, we also we also had an international harvester, Farm O H and an 8N Ford model, uh, both dating from the 30s. And early in the 1900s, uh, up to the Second World War, the crew, the thrashing crews traveled from farm to farm to thrash the small grain crops, wheat, oats, and barley. The crews had their dinner in the middle of the day and they were fed well if you wanted to come back next year. My father quickly adapted my mother <laughs> quickly adapted to feeding these 14 to 16 person crews the dinners the best the farm had to offer. Then we get into World War II and <clears throat> uh, this is the one artifact, one of the artifacts that I have from World War II. We use in chemical warfare. This is a smoke grenade. I have not pulled the pin yet. We might before the end of this talk. <laughs> and this picture might be titled Non-History uh, after my father left the army in 1945 due to injuries in jumping practice he had signed up for the 11th Airborne Division associated with chemical welfare, warfare when he was 48 years old he was elected commandant of the local American Legion and the main project was a large World War II memorial for Orange County it contained a large auditorium, basketball court, a civic committee uh, rooms. He had an option to run some acreage and $10,000 pledged towards the project. And when he died in 1946, the project died. And included in the book are a number of World War 
one in World War II war stories, close to the end of his post activities, of his army post activities of promoting the sale of bonds <clears throat> and the war memorial, he staged a bond selling rally and exhibition at the Gordonsville Airport. And he managed to smoke and tear gas over a hundred people, including my mother and me. <laughs> See the book for details. The, this is the last picture of me with my sister on a horse in 1938. It's proof that I've been riding horseback for 82 years. So let's get on with the other main character, Sander herself. Sander had many talents, started early in her journey. In college, she would knit the intricate uh, Norwegian sweater patterns, requiring much on-the-go math or sitting in a calculus lecture and still get straight A's. She sold her sweaters in the campus bookstore. When we first married, she raised uh, Norwegian elk hounds uh, before our first son was born. She would show her elk hounds with a career climax of grand champion hound in a Richmond dog show. She was an accomplished horsewoman. She broke both the saddle and harness, my wedding present to her, a standard bread and quarter horse cross. Being an outdoor family, we went backpacking at farm life would allow, and the introduction of more livestock to the family did not diminish that activity. Her archaeology pursuits involved her interests in the Paleo era over 12,000 years ago, or soon after the last uh, uh, glacier, Native American habitation in, in uh, central Virginia led her finding over 200 Indian sites within five miles of our farm in Somerset and registering with the Department of Historic Resources. The Stagara Manahoic Mound Dig near Scuffletown and Rapidan River was sponsored by the Orange County Historic Society. She was also involved in saving a Paleo Thunderbird site in the Shenandoah River in Warren County. That project led her to receive the Governor's Award for uh, economic, uh, for Environmental Archaeology Salvage and an appointment to the State Board of Historic Resources by Governor Bryles. This slide represents a small part of her 10,000 item Indian artifact collection. The three arrowheads, see here, a small, there's a broken tip on that one. These are, would be spare points, they'd be too big for arrowheads. This would be a drill, as the Indians would use for uh, drilling leather, uh, wood, uh, whatever. Uh, this is a pipe that Sandra found near the Rapidan mine. It's a kill pipe. Uh, there's a hole knocked in the bottom of it that indicates that uh, when its owner died, the pipe was killed and buried with the owner. And in the center there, uh, this is the last of over, over 10,000 artifacts that she gave to the Bottom Historic Resources in Richmond for research. This is a very rare soapstone bowl. This would be a nutting stone. Uh, this would be pottery shards, a number of arrowheads, spear points. These are two ears of corn she raised from 800-year-old uh, seed that she got from uh, out of an Indian uh, burial ground out in Utah. Uh, these, this is a Clovis spear point. Uh, it is over 12,000-year-old uh, replica, which she uh, was found in the Thunderbird site in Warren County, and she sold those uh, reproductions to raise money to buy the, uh, buy four of the five, three to five acre building sites, compromising the Thunderbird site. And these are stone axes and tomahawk heads that she found near the Stagar site. And the mound report from the dig is available at the, or at for reading at the Orange County Star Society, uh, written by uh, Dr. Holland, Sandra Speeden, and David Van Vorgen. Uh, she was an avocational archaeologist, uh, and this was her working at the Sagara dig. To lot some of the people who could see this helped her in that process. Over 100 Orange County and members of the Stark Society helped her in the, that project. She's an explorer. We went on many horseback trips out in southwest Colorado. This one took us through uh, downtown Telluride. Well, we decided as we had to go through Telluride, might as well make a parade of it, and we went down Main Street. And Sanders, Orange County delegate to the Farm Bureau Convention, representing Orange County Farm Bureau at the state convention. And she's also a reenactor. 
We did the Lolo Trail together, made famous by the Nez Perce during the 1800s Indian Wars. Now, when we talk about the Indians, we want to talk about some more artifacts. Number one, a pipe. A pipe is a sacred item to the Indians, and this it would be held, uh, stored on red velvet, packed with sage. It has a stem and a bowl. And this bowl and stem here, they're kept separate. They're only put together when they're in use. And it is not a, a uh, it, it, it is not a peace pipe. That's an Anglican term. It is just a pipe. It is used for far more reasons than just to have peace. And this, this is a piece of redstone or catlinite, which came out of the only mine in northern United States near Lake Michigan. In 2002, uh, we rode the 300-mile commemoration of Sitting Bull's murder and his band's escape attempt winding up at Wounded Knee, the last of Indian Wars. She returned a pipe she had purchased with the idea of returning it to the Sitting Bull Lakota family. We were 99% sure it was Sitting Bull's and gifting it to Sitting Bull's family resulted in us being invited to the 2002 Youth Ride. This is Sandra, this is Ron, his horse is Thunder. He is triple great-grandson of Sitting Bull. He has a law degree. He was president of Sitting Bull College at the time. On her desk, she bequeathed a small sum to the Sitting Bull College, which triggered a $4 million government grant. They had not the minimum matching money to receive the grant. As a result, the community college on Standing Rock Reservation in Fort Yates, North Dakota, was able to enhance their chemistry lab, initiate a reservation business incubator school, and a new lobby and boardroom, which they named Sandra D. Speeden Boardroom. Sitting Bull College is one of 32 community colleges on reservations in this country. Now, back home in Virginia, I was serving as one of two representatives from Orange County and the Piedmont Monumental Council Board of Directors. I was appointed to the Orange County Planning Commission, which was in conflict by PE see policy at the time to have county officials on their board of directors. To solve that problem, I resigned and Sandra was appointed the PEC board in my place. In 1977, Marline Uranium Company started leasing land in Northern Virginia. They got Somerset Plantation, which is in right here. Uh, that, that is the land that was leased in Somerset Plantation. Signed up for uranium mining and milling thinking everybody else owning possible uranium ore deposits would fall into place and sign up. I had air and water pollution questions, especially as my farm was right on the Rapidan River. The pink areas in this map show the 12,000 acres which were actually signed up. Uh, my farm been right in there, and for various reasons we didn't sign up. But it sounded pretty good to me. Uh, I could stop milking cows and sit back and live high on the uranium royalties. We spent some time in Utah and Colorado researching the industry's record out there. We were in an open pit mine, uh, a drift mine, drift mine is where you walk into, and an underground mine where you go down on the ground. We talked to ranchers and the local sheriff's department. Coming home, we shared some of what we learned. Part of that knowledge was the average ore in this country was only 0.5% uranium, i.e. 99.5% of the ore containing uranium breakdown products such as thorium, radium, radon, radon gas, etc. The half-life of uranium is 500,000 years or forever, whichever comes first. With Omega Health, water, and air problems, where they had out there with 14 inches of rain a year, what would the result be here with 44 inches of rain? The worldwide competition facing our uranium mining interests includes 5 to 6 percent ores in Canada and Australia as opposed to the 0.5 percent ores here. Uh, th this is at Uruvan, this is uh, Colorado, this is the San Miguel River. Uh, these are tailings piles and ponds up top of the hill, these are tailings ponds down here. And just going along the river there you can see the legion coming through all this rock down into the San Miguel River. This has been a super fun site and it's cost us over uh, eight to ten million or, yeah, dollars just to start cleaning it up. With, it's going to be monitored 
forever. Uh, this is one item that can happen to you if you have a well down here and they go underground to the mining and they go under your well and they pump out the water. This is your water table. They have to lower the water table to mine in it and you, you'd be out of luck. Uh, this is the top of the hill here from an aerial point of view of what the tailings piles look like. Uh, this is not out west. This is right here in Louisa County, Virginia. This is Contrary Creek. This is bridge over Route 522. This is not uh, uranium or radioactive waste. This is sulfur waste, acid waste that comes from the old tailings mines and piles and ponds from the gold mines is caused have closed up decades before, so mining can, can affect us here negatively also. After a four-year legislative battle in the state legislature, PEC finally prevailed for the moratorium on mining and milling of the uranium until it can be proven it can be done safely in Virginia. Sander was awarded Director Emeritus status by PEC. The company becoming Virginia Uranium continued to fight this law. In 2019, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld Virginia's right to the moratorium. Hopefully the last nail in this coffin was driven by the Virginia Supreme Court as recently as July 2020. Uh, we will discuss oxen for a minute. Let me ask you a question. Why do we drive on the right side of the road and our steering wheel is the left side of the car? Think on it. Answer coming later. I can tell you that uh, I can get all the oxen I desire, but there's no such thing as a female ox. The dictionary definition of an ox is being a four-year-old steer of any bovine breed. My definition, to clarify, would be by adding that a fox, a ox is a steer, a castrated bull, that can be used for draft purposes. I am not a patient trainer, and on a challenge, I found oxen easy to train and have a high retention level for their training. I've trained, worked with, and reenacted and played with oxen for 45 years. This is pole and cat, at the uh, at cross uh, between Dutch Belted, Dairy Breed, and Holstein. The marking is obviously dominant, but very easy to train, to stand up on the pedestal and shaking hands. Uh, this down praying here, that's cat. Some people want to know how you milk an ox. You well, get them up on the pedestal, you go up and behind them. And they got this handle back there. You pump that long enough, hard enough, and you'll get milk out of the ox. <laughs> Come on. This is a bull lying down, and they're playing dead. Uh, and we use them in parades. This is David Lamb on Bronco, and me on uh, Babe. This is me driving pole and cat at the fair in Orange. Uh, this is Nip and Tuck, another team I had, Holstein Brown Swiss Cross, and Luke, uh, uh, my adopted grandson, or he adopted me as his grandfather. I met Luke at the State Fair when he was five years old, and he fell in love with my oxen then, and he's helped me ever since, and he's now married, he's in his 30s, he has three yoke of his own. Uh, here he is uh, at the Beaver Dam Fair, uh, with. I have a magic carpet that I use out of a piece of an old a kettle feeder and you know, kids you love to ride on it. This is a lady in a wheelchair with her handler holding her on, having the time of her life that day. And this is Joanne and her period dog for the day. Uh, this is an orange and this is Sandra riding Bronco and myself on Babe again, riding in as Pronto and the Lone Stranger ride again. <laughs> And then we have Babe and the Blue Ox. Being Babe was almost all white, so when I watched him for a parade, all I had to do was add a little more bluing for the rinse, and we have Paul Bunny and his Blue Ox Babe. And this is Ringworm, my, my very first ox. I tried to I proved that I could settle break an ox uh, within 15 minutes. And uh, this is a pretty laid back fellow. This is at someone's that he has some steam show. Uh, but Ox life is not all play. Here Bill Speeden, Sir and Loin, and John Lucas plow a field in 1997. So why do we ride on the right side of the road and the steering wheel is the left side of our car? Well, you go back in history of the Revolutionary War, and you remember that Fort Duquesne was owned by the French, and the British took Fort Duquesne as at the uh, confluence of the Allegheny and Mongahela rivers from the Ohio. The British call it Fort Pitt. We captured it from the British, and the 
the Revolutionary War was in the works. Uh, we did not want to be blindsided on the West. So the powers that be asked uh, Ben Franklin to have 2,000 Conestoga wagons built uh, in the Conestoga wagon uh, Valley of Pennsylvania. And they carried freight from Philadelphia to Fort Pitt back and forth supplying this fort. It's a huge fort. And they hired Germans initially to drive the ox teams. Uh, and when they meet on, on the trails, you couldn't dignify them as roads back then, but they would pass left shoulders. They walk on the right side of the ox because your wit's in your right hand is for guidance and keeping them awake, etc. And so if that next time you get into your car and you sit down on your steering wheel, you say, I'm driving a team of oxen. So if you have German blood in you, it's your fault. <laughs> Uh, this is our, one of our big events, uh, trail ride. And this is a Colorado Trail in 1996. After selling the farm and moving to our retirement home in Blue Hill in Somerset in 1995, we ramrodded our most challenging trail ride yet, 500 miles from Denver to Durango. This is my 60th birthday present to myself. We were on our own on the trail for seven weeks. We set up 36 campsites, rode through six wilderness areas, seven national forests, eight mountain ranges, crossed the Continental Divide at least 12 times, tied on over 130 horsebacks, and only twice did we have to repack uh, during the day. So this is this is our, our group there. This is myself, this is Sandra, and this is Rob, my son, and the fourth party was, guess who, Joanne, Nelson, who was with us on that 500 mile trip. Somebody had to take the photographs. Uh, this is uh, Rob negotiating a snow drift. This was in August uh, in 1996, uh, and we were actually blocked by snow going over that mountain and had to retreat. This is us crossing the Rio Grande River. There are myself and Rob and uh, uh, Sandra, and again, Joanne taking the picture. But we were on our own. We didn't have everything we needed all the way. It was a horse we needed to hobble every now and then, so we cut the bottom out of a, a feed sack and tied it up in a knot like that, and that horse was taken care of without any problem from then on. Uh, this is Sandra coming down one of the slopes. Uh, we came down uh, near Silverton, Colorado. This is Robert riding over a snowpack. This is up above about 12,000 feet. Our season is T-shirt, and this is the end of July for early August. I was always Camp Cook, and we, uh, sometimes though we were in forest, we'd hang some of the packs, but we really didn't have to. We were worried about bear. The horses are bigger than bear, and we had horses, so the bear weren't going to come around and bother us, and never did. And this is Rob, diehard camper. I was still riding a saddle when we got back to the motel, uh, wearing his. Uh, T-shirt um, with uh, our trip motto was life is a journey, not a guided tour. So, after Tyler, uh, this was Tyler's first visit uh, to us after he was born in the first visit in 2006. This is his mother Melanie, this is Tyler, and this is uh, my son uh, Leith getting Tyler off to a good start in life. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I wrote this book with the idea of giving it to him for his uh, 15th birthday, which is in December, but with the virus being what it is, once he went to school we weren't sure he'd be able to visit us this year, so we had it early uh, this year in uh, September. And so this, this picture took of him when we presented him with uh, letters for Tyler. So, We've been through the War of 1812, which we were involved in, the Wilkes Expedition, the Perry Expedition, some in the Civil War, uh, Pancho Vila, Second World War, we got into farming, went on the home front during the war. This is my mother ran the Red Cross unit, uh, making surgical dressings. This is in the old Ricketts building, which is now the Art Center, uh, just across the track and, and upstairs. Uh, this is the uh, monument that hadn't happened yet. And then after my father died, my mother ran the farm until I got out of college. Here she's working cattle through the chute. 
and I sold out in March of 1995. Letters to Tyler was published by Amazon in January 2020. This is a cover, the table of contents, and the back cover and comments by our own Jane Blair. And the book contains 545 illustrations and images, 143 historic footnotes, and 511 pages. So this is an attempt to give Tyler a smattering of history, not only of his personal line, their careers, the play, the ups and downs, and how one family were cogs in the wheels of the local, state, national, and international history. Since Tyler was born, Tyler's mother has married, and she and her husband are living near Richmond. They officially adopted Tyler, giving his father and me his grandfather visitation rights. This book is published with encouragement of the Orange County Historic Society Associates. It's available for $20 at the Orange County Historic Society, James Madison Museum, and me. Proceeds of which 100% go to said institutions, minus the governor's share. It's also available from Amazon. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. All right. So you, you mentioned briefly about the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it, do you have any, can you like give any? Yeah, a smattering of that. that. that that's, a, that's a bizarre story in itself. Uh, Smithson uh, was a high-born bastard and a man with ambitions. His father was a wealthy Yorkshire uh, baron and who became Duke of Northumberland. His mother was a descendant of Henry VII. But because these two illustrious parents never got married, at least to each other, uh, James Smithson had no chance of inheriting his father's uh, title or dukedom. Eventually he inherited a good deal of money from his mother and decided to leave it to his illegitimate uh, nephew, 20-year-old nephew, uh, with a remarkable st stimulation uh, stipulation attached. If the nephew died childless, the fortune would go towards an establishment for the increase and diff diffusion of knowledge among men. Not in England, not at all. The Smithsonian was not about to do that. The money was to go to the United States of America. The eventual result was the Smithsonian Institution. Nevertheless, in 1836, Congress voted to accept the Smithsonian bequest. Richard Rush, a brother of Benjamin Rush, was dispatched to London to fetch the money. He didn't get it out until 1841, a lot of red tape involved. He wisely waited. It had been invested, apparently wisely, and they sold it at a high, and they actually sent it back in, in sovereigns, bags and bags, uh, uh, over 105,000 <coughs> sovereign pieces of gold <coughs> was shipped back to the United States. And there they sat until Pope became president, because they uh, hemmed and hawed as what to do with his money. and. In uh, 1846, Pope finally signed, signed the decoration that we would use this for the Smithsonian Institute. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Soundtrack.